you know, Showtime Lakers and all they playing on the same court. And we get out there and coach on the other team. You're like, damn, I'm going to play against Kobe tonight. This is nuts. And before you know it, that start, that uh, star struckness or the fandom gets gets uh, gets smacked in the face pretty quick because he's calling for a post up and I'm guarding him. And he knows it's a mismatch. And he's like holding my leg and calling for the ball. And I'm like stuck. I can't do nothing. I'm my dumb self looking at the ref thinking the ref's gonna bail me out like yo you don't see what he's doing like this is Kobe Bryant man we ain't he can do whatever big boys neighborhood beautiful day in the neighborhood ladies and gentlemen it is a pleasure and an honor to have this man in the neighborhood and that is Steph Curry Steph welcome to the neighborhood brother how you feeling I'm feeling great a pleasure to be here my man man Thank you for having me. And, and one day, God willing, we're going to do this in person. You know what I'm saying? But yes, you was like, oh, big, I, I really need to come on. So you were begging to jump in right now. So I was like, you know what? F it. Let's do the interview. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking right now. We got yeah. a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, and, and we do have a lot to talk about, man. And the first thing that I want to say, bro, is I had a chance to see Underrated. And Underrated was, I'm a documentary guy. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think that you have to be a sports fan or even a Steph Curry fan to understand how great this documentary is and how powerful it is just for anyone to see these kind of things that don't have anything to do with sports. It's like a life documentary. I know it's a simple question, but why the title underrated? Uh, I mean, the way that you just explained it is entirely what we were after. And we didn't even know it at the time in terms of, how widespread some of the themes that come through this documentary can can reach different people from different backgrounds. Uh, underrated as a title for me is a badge of honor. It's something that uh, mm -hmm. I have kind of adopted or I adopted way back when, when the juxtaposition of being an NBA son, right? Your dad right. played in the league for 16 years and uh, I grew up in Charlotte where he, you know, cemented his legacy as a great, you know, Hornet. And you would think that, like, oh, I chose basketball to pursue, um, you know, some natural gifts that came with it, but didn't pass the eye test. Uh, mm -hmm. Had critics, naysayers from from jump from the time I can remember. Uh, you know, I had to kind of wait patiently for my opportunity in the recruiting process. The same thing kind of happened. Um, where you're growing up in ACC country and wanting to play with the big schools and none of those schools are offering. They always talk about what you can't do and what you're mm. not good at and what you're lacking. I adopted that underrated mindset of, you know, really believing in what I could be and what I was and what I could offer um, and really, you know, believing in it and having people around me as well that, uh, that, that spoke you know, positivity and encouragement and support into that mission as well. Um, so underrated as a badge of honor for me, I feel like is a human and universal experience. It's something that, that at some point or another, everybody's felt that whether they yes, treat it as their life mantra or not, that's another thing. But I feel like everybody understands what it feels like to be underrated in some way, shape or form. And so it perfectly kind of summarized the entire origin story of, um, you know, my life and in, in the game of basketball off the court, those formative years at Davidson College where, you know, I kind of sprang onto the, the national map. Um, but even the criticism that came right after when I was coming right. through the NBA ranks early. So um felt like it, it perfectly summarized exactly where this all began. And even now, it might not sound – it sounds crazy with the resume, but I still hold an underrated DNA with me in terms of, you know – continuing to prove to myself what I'm capable of um, as I go through my career. Did you always feel, even as a as a kid, as a child, going into high school, then going into college, then going into the NBA, did you always feel like you always had to prove yourself? Like you had to be so-called just as good to just make some noise? Oh, 100%. Um, like I said, because nothing was really given to me in the sense of um, when it comes to success at, at what I, you know, what I chose to do in terms of playing basketball. And, you know, even the first year I played AAU basketball on a 10 and under team, 
they only put me in to shoot uh, teams out of a zone uh, defense. Right. <laughs> and then as soon as I was the zone buster, and as soon as they went back to man to man, I uh, you hear the horn sound. You look over like not me. No, <laughs> I'm going back to the bench. So like just the ability to know whatever I got in the game, I had to earn. I had to deserve. Uh, I had to work for. Uh, the patience that came with that. That's how I saw the game from jump. And as much of a motivator, it has been my entire career. It's also allowed me to be very appreciative and, 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 uh, and have gratitude for, you know, what I have been able to experience and accomplish in this game because uh, nothing was guaranteed. And you've heard it all, bro. Like even watching underrated, the documentary, you heard it all. You heard he's weak. He has no muscle. He's scrawny. Even your grandmother was like, oh, he was so itty bitty. And I'm like, damn, grandmama. <laughs> grandmama, you know? she, she went at me. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I love Keeping that you real. kept it in. But it's one of those things, man, where you hear so much. How do you not let that get into your psyche where you just say, you know what? Maybe I am too small. Maybe I am too weak. Maybe I am too little. It's a constant... Uh... And at that early age, though, yeah. at that early age. It's interesting because even at that early age, that's all I knew, right? That's, mm -hmm. I hear a couple, oh, he could shoot, uh, you know, that's Dale's son, this and that. But the more uh, the majority of what I heard was, you know, what I, again, what I couldn't do. And again, you have to, you have decisions to make when you, when you hear that type of stuff, whether to believe it or not. And thankfully, I didn't. Thankfully, um, the the positive self talk kind of won out on all of those different episodes. And thankfully, um, you develop an ability to redirect some of that energy. Like even now, um, when you hear about oh you're washed up, the 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 runs over, or you know the pastor prime or all that, you just take it as like a almost a form of entertainment because you know, like at the end of the day. I have a decision to believe that I'm capable of whatever you put your mind to. And that confidence comes on deserving it because of the work that you put in. It's not like a false, just mm. uh, hype yourself up type vibe. It's not, it's not the end result. It's the process. It's the work. It's the, it's the grind. And I feel like anybody who's successful at anything, building a, an amazing brand in the world of entertainment, like you have, like yes, sir. you work for that. Like, it's not something that uh, you just woke up one day and you had. So, like, um, the reflection on all of that is about, you know, embracing it, right? You don't, it's, you can't control what you do and do not hear, the distractions that come in, mm -hmm. but the decision on what you do with that, you better be active in that decision. Um, and you have to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Yeah, and that's the one thing when you say you have to keep doing it over and over and over again. It's like you're in competition with yourself. And I mm -hmm. noticed also in the championship in 21, 22, 22, you, mm -hmm. you bawled, you cried. Like it was almost like your first one. <laughs> is, is there a reason why that one felt just as special? Was it the, the, the chatter that you heard with being so great that it's a gift and a curse? I, absolutely. Um, I don't know what, whether the 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 criticism or the the knocks come before or even after success, like they're going to come, and we got so far away from the mountaintop at a, at a certain point with you know the injuries, the changing of the scenery, uh, moving from Oakland to San Francisco, our roster changing, like you name it. Um, we got so far away from it. You understood how hard it was to get back to that to that level, the fact that none of it was guaranteed, but that was just a culmination of a three year journey for, from since game six of the 2019 finals to game six of the 22 finals. Uh, that three year journey was an emotional roller coaster, And uh, there were plenty of opportunities to let go of the rope. There mm -hmm. were plenty of opportunities to throw in the towel and sit on, you know, rest on the laurels of success and say, Oh, we got three of them. That's cool. Like, can't nobody take those like me, Draymond Clay, you know, Andre, the guys that have been around for those years. Like we knew um we were capable, but three years of of a process that you don't know what the outcome is gonna be, it was an emotional, 
you know, load. And so letting it all out on the court, um, you know, after after game six, after the horn goes off, that's what that was. And honestly, I hope to have that emotion again, um, you know, because you're like, you almost, you're right in that kind of cycle of one more time, uh, you know, currently. So that's why it's all worth it, right? That's why I think the story resonates because, um, you know, we all want to be successful at something. And then, again, it's not just about me. That's the best part about it. Like anything you do, you know, or any successes that you have in this life, you, you're probably not doing them by yourself. And so right. the shared experiences of it all is truly reflective in my Davidson experience. It has been in my Warriors experience and even the stuff that I get to do off the court. Speaking of your Davidson experience going to college, bro, you, you, you thinking about one and then another comes and just change your entire life. When you, when you go to Davidson, when you look back at underrated and you see a rewind of your life, what did those years, what did those years feel like when you watch it now? It's a difference between in real time. When you look back and watch that legacy, what do you see? Uh, two things. One, in the documentary, there's a scene uh, where we talk about my first college game. Oh, my God. Playing against Eastern Michigan uh, at the University of Michigan. So it's like a little tournament. And first game of playing against Eastern Michigan. And I, I, I used to tell over the last, what, 15 years, I used to tell that story all the time. Like, hey, I, you know, don't get defeated by your failures. Like, I had 13 turnovers in my first game. Uh, Coach McKillop, I had nine at halftime, and he had to decide whether he was going to keep playing me or not because I was just – I was bad and this and that. I tell that story all the time. But you know what? I know I how it turned out, right? I'm sitting here with you. I know Steph Curry legacy. Even when I was watching that in 13 turnovers, I was like, man, this dude sucks. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> dude, I was like, man. And, and knowing that you, I would have, I was like, man, I hope this dude turn into something. Because looking <laughs> at this, I was like, oh, my God, bro. 13 turnovers. Like, I would have, my son play basketball. If my son, yeah, I and I encourage <laughs> I encourage him on everything, man. And we never we leave it on the on the court. We don't take it to the car. But 13 turnovers, I would have been like, son, you know what? Daddy can bring you into big boy's neighborhood. You can become a, a, an associate producer. You don't have to embarrass the family like this. So now you use it as a motive. You use it as motivation. But what did that so feel good. like? <laughs> but that's the thing. It's so it's so good because I'm like, all right. Even if you looked at it on the stat sheet, you'd be like, all right, that's horrible. That would stand out like a sore thumb. But I watched the the, the lowlights, the, the the compilation of all the turnovers and me tr tripping over you. So like you said, I sucked that game, and it was 100 times worse watching it than I remembered back Ooh. in the day. So, like, just the – and that speaks to, like, just the entire Davidson experience because I'm so grateful that the landscape today is so different, right, in terms of – you know, how social media is taking over, you know, the different exposure that kids go through way earlier in their process. Mm -hmm. I've been grateful that I got to develop at a pace that was right for me and to be able to form an identity of who I was. Because, like, say, you know, anybody sees that footage while I'm about to go into the NBA draft or, like, from a fan perspective, even the narrative around my game is totally different. Um, you know, that 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 freshman year, until, until you do something different to overcome it. But I I only got, I got to process that process that for myself, you know, digest it, learn from it, uh, you know, develop an attitude like I can't be a fail afraid of failure after this. I have to just leave it all out there and um, and, and find ways to you know see the game in a way that's going to help me be successful down the road. But um, through those three years, man, like. Just, there's just a natural progression of coming into your own and, and truly believing that you're capable no matter what anybody else is saying around you because, um, you know, the work that, that went into it, the the, the sacrifice, just the um, – Coach McKillop always says, like, life is, is a – sports is a microcosm of life, but, you know, you're always on stage and he has like a lot of Broadway references to, to you know, putting together a team and you know, everybody playing their role to their perfection is the only way that you're going to have a beautiful play at the end of the day. And, um, 
for me to play my role, I had to work through that because he expected so much of me as a leader of the team, um, the engine that was going to carry us to where we needed to go. If I got discouraged by that one game, who knows how different life is? Who knows how different the game of basketball is? Who knows? Had he made a different decision to sit my butt down and just and extinguish the flame, who knows how different my story is? So all those things, um, it's a great time to kind of reflect on it. Um, and also laugh at yourself, too, because, God dang, that was bad. Okay, so I don't feel as bad when I was laughing at you. <laughs> Had you always been a three-point shooter? Yeah, that's – I always enjoyed it. Uh, I was always, you know, pushing myself out to the limits of my range and all that. Uh, I know they talked about, uh, we talked about my, me changing my shot in high school to try to um, get ready for, you know, the varsity level because I was undersized and short and not as strong, but I had to change my release point and all this, you know, the mechanics of it all. But I loved to shoot from jump and uh, the way that I saw the game uh, from day one, for sure. Do you feel like you've changed the three-point shot as far as when it comes to the NBA now? Like, everybody wants that shooter. Everyone wants to shoot from from the three. I saw a clip of somebody. I don't even remember his name, bro. But he shot the three, and he did the Curry turnaround. And oh, uh, no. I saw that the dude from Toronto in Summer League. I saw, yeah, and he I did the shot, too. and then it was like, bro, it didn't go in. He was like, "Oh, oh, my bad." <laughs> and they said, and they said, "Blame." They said, "Blame me for it." Yeah, uh, <laughs> but you always been the three point guy. And when did the 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 walk away? When did that start? So like the first part, the oh, game has definitely changed. I know exactly yeah. Oh, yeah. why, in, in terms of the influence that I've had, and like being able to pass on like the way Dame Lillard plays, the way Trey Young plays. None of. Uh, the only guy, um, Sharif, uh, I'm not, uh, blanking on his name right now, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, sorry, mm -hmm. who, uh, who played a similar style back in the day. And he's got an unbelievable documentary out called Stan that talks about his career and, uh, some of the political things that, uh, derail his career and, and sorry, but he's like the one guy that was like the model for what we, what, how the way that I play, but we had to take that. And turn it into what it is today. You got big man trying to shoot threes. You got mm -hmm. teams making sure they got four, five shooters that can shoot outside the three point line on the court at all times. The the volume of threes that are going up, like it's totally different than you know even twelve, ten, twelve years ago. Uh, and I know I've had a lot to do with that, but the the performative elements of it, like the the turn away, look away threes, or you know, extending your range out to just inside a half court, like all that stuff is just kind of adapted, involved over time. Um, just based off of me displaying like pure, authentic creativity out there. The very first time I did it, though, uh, was in the 2013 first round, uh, the playoffs against Denver. There's a, there's a I got, it's only, we got a clip of it, but uh, it's like the third quarter of game three. And, it was like a swing around the perimeter, and I'm on the wing in front of the Denver's bench, and they're all standing up because it's like a big part of a, a run in the quarter. I shoot the three, and JaVale McGee, my, my old teammate's behind me, he starts yelling. I forget exactly what he is, he starts yelling. And it's just a flow. Like, I don't even know why I did it. I don't know why it was then. Let it go. Felt good. Right off the release, it was perfect. Spin is probably like, there's no way it's going anywhere but through the net. And as a, as a release, to turn around, I just look at him and then take a step and start running down the court and it goes in. Uh, that was like an unlock of just full confidence that I had never experienced before. Uh, but you can imagine how many reps went into that moment. <laughs> so it was man. pretty crazy. Hey man, and, and I remember one when you shot it, and I think you were in the visitor's restroom. And you <laughs> shot from the visitor's restroom. And and it went in, you know what I'm saying? But but that those shots, bro, are un they're unbelievable. And from your release, do you know that it's going in when you as soon as you let the ball go, can you feel it? Yeah, there's a there's a flow state that you can get into. And again, it's based off of I think I was trying to do like an amateur calculation of how many threes or shots I've taken in my life. Um mm. and I'm I Amateur math, I'm somewhere in like the 700, 750,000s in there of like shots that I've made. 
in my life. Um, oh my God. And so like you have a, an understanding of what the perfect release is, what the perfect, um, you know, sensation is of us is going in and I don't know. In those, in those moments, like that flow state just takes over the muscle memory takes over. Um, and it just feels, it feels different. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's again, based off of, you know, 30 plus years of playing this game. How do you feel about when people throw your name in for, for <clears throat> the goat, the greatest of all time? I mean, that's a, so for the way that I kind of, you know, see legacy and see overall impact, and it's not a cop out answer because it's just the nature of the, the skill level of what we do and the level of what we are, of how we do it. There are, there are a lot of goats and a lot for a lot of different reasons in the sense of, um, you know, pure skill, pure shooting, influence on the game, you know, the greatest winners, the greatest champions, you know, name the category, but in terms of like the upper echelon of the NBA and all of its history, no matter what the era is, no matter what style of play you prefer, um, no matter if you're a fan or not, like if you're in that conversation of guys that, you know, change the game in a way that you probably won't ever see again. Um, that's where you feel a certain level of appreciation, gratitude, like respect and honor. Um, Cause everybody's got their guy. But I think if you look at the whole, you know, there's a category, you know, the, the, the MJs, the bronze, the Kobe's, uh, the magics, Kareem's, you know, Larry birds. Uh, you want to be in that group. Right. And like, you want to be in that position of um, hands down, a true champion, a true great, true skill, um, and doing everything you can to be a part of that conversation. When you when you look at what's going on with just with the NBA right now, you know, <clears throat> the NBA, you know, they're they're running faster. Like we say they they, you know, they're shooting from the outside a little bit more. Do you have any uh, like you got the rings, you just got a hole in one. I don't know if you're gonna start playing, you know, more <laughs> golf or whatever it is either. And you one of them dudes, man, where you know how people say, oh, man, he light-skinned. I don't trip off of that. I trip off of when I feel like people are better than me and my son or my family admires them. You know what uh, I'm saying? I so know what mean, it's not yeah. jealousy. It's I, What is it called? <laughs> like being a little salty is probably what I am with you sometimes. <laughs> Just being a little salty. But you're one of those guys, man. You can see you put the work in. But even when I, was, when I brought up the holy one, that's one of those things, bro, where I'm like, it feels like this dude can do no wrong. But if you shot and made 750,000 threes, then you probably had to double and triple that in how many you missed. Oh, a hundred percent. And that's the yeah. thing. Like, I mean, it's the old, uh, it's the old Michael Jordan thing. I used to see on, on the, the picture on the wall. Like you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. You don't, yep. But there's a certain way of approaching I mean, sports in general, but I, it's it's a life principle of of competition, right? Like there's a that's a skill set in and of itself of seeing you know a task or a challenge or whatever it is, and you just attack it, and you're not afraid of what the failure might be behind it. Or you're not afraid of you know exposing yourself or whatever the case it is. And, um, you know, that is a skill set I think you can develop, but the ones that have it more naturally, um, it, it, it does them, you know, justice along the way. So anything that I do, and that's the thing, anybody who knows me, like I'm trying to win at every at, at all costs, no matter what I'm doing, whether it's on the golf course, whether it's playing basketball, whether it's a board game at the crib, like it's kind of a running joke of, you know, this dude won't chill out, even though I do it with a smile on my face and I have joy behind it. Like I got a killer instinct that, um are you, you know, I, love the, I love the a, competition a competitive nature as well you take that yeah, with you everywhere and it's, and it's different because like kobe kobe bryant is one of the best compliments i ever got when he recognized that killer instinct behind the smile mm -hmm. and like you know mama mama mentality is is 
it's a it has a name and it's a thing because you can just see it on his face like I'm out here to kill every single person in front of right. me to get to where I want to go. Uh, but he acknowledged that same spirit, but he knew that I did it with a smile on my face and right. the joy that came with it. He's like, but don't get fooled. Like he's coming for your heart kind of vibe. And I appreciate that compliment because it, you know, it's coming from somebody who knew what that energy was like, but it is funny not, <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. <clears throat> Even me playing, um, playing, uh, video games with my 11 year old or whatever the case is like you're not gonna let me win like no what's, what's that mean like, like, yeah <laughs> how, how do you learn in life you know <laughs> and, and, and speaking of kobe bryant man kobe's in the league of course before you you get you you're in the league then you get do, do you recognize kobe bryant as an nba player before you get to the nba because i noticed in underrated when lebron asked for tickets to the game you were stoked about LeBron coming to see you guys play. Were you equally as stoked when it came to Kobe Bryant and your relationship with Kobe in the NBA? Absolutely. Like being a, a hoop head and you know, being around the NBA circles, my dad playing and all that. I was a I'm a I'm a fan, like a true fan of the game. Um you appreciate the skill set, you appreciate just the mastery of what they do. And it is a uh, it's a shell shock when I made a transition to the league. One of my first preseason games was against Kobe, and we played um, uh, in L.A. What's the old arena called? I'm tripping. Um, um, the Staples Center before the Staples. No, the, the one the before. Forum? The, yeah, the Forum. Thank you. Uh, we That's played at the Forum, thing. so it was like you know Showtime Lakers and all they playing on the same court, and we get out there and coach on the team. And you're like, damn, I'm about to play against Kobe tonight. This is nuts. And before you know it, that start, that uh, star struckness, or the fandom gets gets uh, gets smacked in the face pretty quick because he's calling for a post up, and I'm guarding him. And he knows it's a mismatch, and he's like holding my leg and calling for the ball, and I'm like stuck. I can't do nothing. I'm my dumb self looking at the ref, thinking the ref's gonna bail me out. Like, yo, you don't see what he's doing? Like, this is Kobe Bryant, man. We ain't, he can do whatever. Gets the gets on the block, baseline spin, pull up jumper, and you're like watching it in slow motion, kind of not realizing it's you <laughs> guarding. Mm -hmm. uh, so that welcome to the NBA moment is unreal. Um, but you go through that. I know the young guys. It's weird being on the other side of that now, going into my 15th year, right? Being uh being in, in Kobe's shoes a, a little bit in that respect. But uh, yeah, that that uh, that transition happens really fast because. Um, you realize just again how, how cutthroat the league is and how everybody's trying to you know fight for the same thing. And you when you when you view the NBA, man, Kobe is one of those names that just will always and forever be connected with the NBA. And it seemed like there's gonna be so many beautiful things after his career. You know, a long great career, but it seemed like there's gonna be so many beautiful things, bro. Do you remember? Because everybody have a I remember where I was at when I heard that Kobe passed. Do you have your I remember exactly where I was at? Yeah, we were uh, <clears throat> um, in practice. I was hurt at the time. I broke my hand earlier in the season. Uh, so this is 2020. Uh, so in like fall of 19, I broke my hand. I was out for three months. And I just started to come back on the court to practice, trying to get you know ready for my return. And we were having a morning practice and doing a, a transition drill. Um, it was like one of the first two practices. I was already like kind of hyped to be back out there. I had a lot, of, a lot of juices flowing, and like right in the middle of our our uh, our reps, going running back and up and down the court, you could see like. Some coaches on the side, like, start whispering to each other. You could see um, a different energy start to kind of get spread throughout that side of the court. And slowly but surely, he passed from ear to ear all the way to, you know, some of the players who were in the drill and mentioned what had happened. And, like, obviously in complete disbelief, like, hoping that it's not true. We actually shut practice down right then. Um, everybody went home and – uh to be with their families, and you know, once it was it was uh, acknowledged that it actually happened, like you know, obviously your heart melts, tears are flowing, and it 
it, it grounds you in, in, you know, appreciating life, man, because, like, we're all just out there hooping, having a good time, and you realize somebody who ushered in a, a new generation of basketball, you know, left us way too early, and obviously his daughter as well and everybody else mm-hmm. on the helicopter. So um, tough, but definitely remember where it was. We'll forever remember it, and I know we're all trying to honor, you know, his life um, any way that we can by how we – you know, approach every day in terms of, you know, being competitive, enjoying the moment, but, uh, you know, being appreciative and grateful of every blessing that we have. Yes, sir, Steph. And you're building, continuing to build a legacy. And you say you're going, to, you're going into your 15th year? Start my 15th year. Things are happening fast, big boy. Man, yeah, and four, four rings already, right? Yes, sir. If you were to take one of your rings and give it to someone that doesn't have a ring, who would you give that ring to? What a question. That, oh, that's a great question. I would, well, this is what I do, ooh. Steph. You know what I'm saying? No, <laughs> I like this. I, this, oh, is, this. I've never answered this question before. Um, it would not be Charles Barkley. Well, he'd eat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. man, this ring is so delicious. Uh, this ring is delicious. <laughs> All right. I, can I pick two people? Yeah, pick I would two pick, people. Uh, I would pick Steve Nash. Yes, sir. Oh, sh- and I would pick Damn. Ooh, Reggie Miller. Damn. Hey, man, you know what's crazy about that is in my head, I didn't think that Steve Nash, I didn't, I, I, was, I thought you would think Steve Nash had a ring. You Absolutely. would think Reggie that Miller list is pretty insane, yeah, isn't it? So it's crazy how selfish you are to have these other basketball players that don't have one, and you get in the line four times and take four rings from deserving people, and you was like, "Oh, big, the list goes on." Oh my God, big, the list is vast. That was just, yeah, that, that was just two, and I'm gonna deny a couple others. You know, there was one that I was thinking right now, too, but he still got career left. But it's like he's he's been so close that I'm like, ah, oh, man, I, I I want that guy to get one as well. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to say his name because uh, we were asking who would you give one to? You know uh, what I'm absolutely. saying? Absolutely. So where, where, where do that you keep hilarious. where do you keep your rings at? And do sometimes do you just put them all on and go and floss or just you know what I'm saying? Like, can you put your rings on? I know exactly where they are. Don't say it. They're, because, my, you know, they're in my yeah. house. Yeah, I just they're in, they're in the house. Uh, I've put since I got the fourth one in what no October. I actually haven't seen them since October. Oh. Um, but I've put I put them all on twice. Like the night we got them, after we got home from the ring ceremony night, and maybe the next day I had them all while I was eating dinner at the crib. Right, as you should. Um, just for fun. A little role playing. I haven't, I haven't seen him. Yeah, a little something like that. I haven't seen him. I'll probably look at him maybe once or twice before next season starts. Um, and why? But yeah, it's not really – just a little motivation, honestly. Right. Like, because um, you remember, like, they're the symbol of the experience, right? It's not just so much about the ring. It's that it's a symbol of every moment that went into, you know, pouring champagne on yourself and celebrating with your teammates and just how good that feeling was and wanting to feel it again. Um, so I have a picture of all four of them on my hand from ring night this past season. And uh, it's special, man, because you realize how much goes into each one of them, let alone all of them on your hand. But now I'm going back to the last question because I'm rubbing it in again. <laughs> yeah. Do you – do you – do you keep certain things? Like, what do you keep? Like, if there's a situation where you get ring one, two, three, or four, and, and just like your kids, all of them are special, correct? Absolutely. And, they're, they're all little different shapes and sizes, but they're all special. And when – do you keep anything? Like, do you keep the jersey from that night? Do you keep – do you make sure you keep the entire uniform? Do you try to get a ball from that night? Like, what do, what do you have that's memorabilia to you? For each one of them, I have the shoes I wore, the jersey, um, you don't cut down the net like they do in college, which is, they need to switch that. That's but cool you know moment. what? I think you could cut down the net. There's, there's a couple people that you'll say, oh, Steph is cutting down the net. 
You know what I'm saying? No, I'm gonna do it next time. Yeah, just do it next time, bro. <laughs> the jersey, the shoes for sure. The ball is a is a hot subject when you win. I messed the very first championship we won. I messed up. I was so excited we won. I threw the ball in the air, and uh, next thing I know, I see Andre acting like a, a, a slot receiver running around the court trying to catch it. And I slung it up towards the scoreboard. He caught it. He so he kept that one. I think I kept the one from uh, this past season, um, from twenty two uh, championship. But yeah, it's it's weird. Like you keep that. You keep a couple of newspaper clippings from the next day of you winning the championship and all that. And only I keep the finals MVP trophy. I keep that out. Yes, sir. Um, just so I can, you know, just so I can see it. But that's about it. Off of basketball, what's the privilege that come with being Steph Curry? Do you know that if there's a concert, Drake saying, okay, Drake, you were just recently at a Drake concert, I right? Did, yeah. Do you have to buy tickets or being Steph Curry? Can you just say, hey, man, oh, Drake, yeah, let's go. And show so, up. Drake's a special, he's a special example because we're actually boys. And uh, my wife's cousin is um, a part of the OVO crew. Like he's a, he's a, on the business uh, management team there. So there's a couple of other connections to, to that where I, I, saw, I don't have to pay for tickets for that. But for the most part, like I'm one of them dudes that I really don't want to inconvenience anybody to go, like, I don't want to go, that's my last resort is to call you to be like, hey, can I get tickets to whatever? Um, but sometimes when they know you're coming, yeah, I, it's how I would do it. If like, I knew somebody was coming to my game, I would try to go out of my way to make sure they had a good time and enjoy the experience. But yeah, I don't ever want to try to in, in, in inconvenience people be like, yo, I know you, I know what it's like to be you know, performing and all right. that. So the last thing you really want is your phone blowing up an hour before your show. Like, you know, let's say, coming in. let's say you don't call. Are you famous enough to just walk up to the door? I've never tried it, but I would man, hope try so. it, bro. I've tried <laughs> I it. Hope so. hey, I've tried it, man. Here? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's my my wife. She uses that at Disneyland, and I am nowhere close to being Steph Curry because you your yeah. face. You're you're known all over the world, and I think that's the reason why you're blessed with it too. Because if I had your gift, your gift can be your curse. If I had your gift, it would be my gift and it would be my curse because I would <laughs> overuse leverage it. the hell out of it. Oh yeah. my God, bro. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Only time be, I would... really use it is like, like uh, reservations at restaurants, like yes. big boys and stuff like that. Like, Do you I'll, say uh, it? I, so you... that's the funniest thing. I mean, I, when I name drop, I get so uncomfortable that I need an audience with me because I need, like, just to kind of make it lighthearted. So I'd be like, yo, I'm about to call XYZ spot. Hold on. And I put it on speaker. And my voice gets real shaky and real awkward. Like, hey, how you doing? This is uh, uh, Stephen Curry calling. Uh, and then you, you pause awkwardly right after and see if they catch on. And if they don't, then you just keep going until they do. Yeah, you're like, all right, I'm just <laughs> celebrating. Put my rings up. Can you put one of my rings up? Thank you, thank you. Hold, hold, hold on for a second. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, hold, hold on. All right, hold on, coach. Yeah, yeah. But I and, and I just wonder, like, and I know these had nothing to do with underrated, but being that I have you here, there is just questions that I always wanted to ask about, like the NBA when it comes to privilege. How many uniforms do you have? Because I remember I asked Derek Fisher. I said, Fish, I said, how many uniforms do you get? Because you'll see sometimes back in the days, they used to take the jersey off and throw it. Throw and he was like, big. Yeah. He said, we only get like two uniforms. How many uniforms we, uh, do you have? I don't know the exact number, but I know it's – I know we get a, a, a uh, an allotment of them that if you go over, you have to pay for. So the ones, the people that be – you know, doing the jersey swaps and, you know, slinging them in the stands or or giving away to family and all that type of stuff. There's a certain quota, you get them for free, and then after that you're paying retail price for them. So uh, they dip it into my check for sure because I give them out all over the place. But uh, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Is it a difference? Like, say, for instance, and I don't know if you have people around you, but I think we all do. Somebody that always wants something. And they call you up and they're like, Steph, man, you know, I'm low this time, man, and I really need something. Do you give them cash or do you say, here, man, take a signed jersey and go sell that for 30000 <laughs> and don't come back? That's the, 
You know, that's the one thing I can't be I can't be flooding the streets with this merch. So yeah, that is true. That yeah, is I gotta true. I, I gotta I gotta I gotta you know supply and demand. I gotta make sure I'm all on the right side of that one. <laughs> do you all do you still trip off of that? You're Steph Curry, and the reason why I ask is because I've been on the air and radio to be thirty years, right? And I still hear my voice. Thank you, bro. That's exactly the compliment I was looking out for. I'm glad you fell into it. Uh, Cause you know my boss is on here. I'm in a renegotiation year and everything, man. So I'm throwing All everything right. out. All yeah, right. but I'm but you're I, underrated too. Yeah, do you know what? I am underrated. You know what I'm saying? I'm underrated. I'm underpaid. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna bring my wife in. I'm undersexed. So if you can help us out with that yeah. as well. <laughs> but being on radio for like 30 years, right? It's crazy because I'll still hear a commercial and I'm like, damn, that's me. Or somebody will walk up to me and ask for a picture and I trip off that someone has, like even right now talking to you, I'm on your schedule and that trips mm -hmm. me out. Does it trip you out sometimes that you'll walk out somewhere and you're like, damn, dude, I'm Steph Curry? And not braggadocious. The only time it does. No, 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 I know what you mean. The only, like it does to a certain extent. People remind you, uh, or I should say, there's times when people remind me, like, yo, you, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't, the question you just asked about, like, name dropping or, you know, going these places, using the perks of your name, like, why don't you do that more? Like, you know who you are? Like, I'm like, what are you talking about? So there's, like, a weird complex there. The other only time is now we got kids and, like, a commercial will come on, like, my Subway commercial or Under Armour Curry Brand commercial or something. It'd be like, the TV's on in the next room. And it's on a game or something. I'm in the kitchen. <clears throat> you hear your voice. It's like, oh, the, the ball sub is whatever, yada, yada. And like my kids are like, daddy, it's you. Daddy. And like those moments, they're like mad fun just because they, they get kids getting kick out of it. But it's the weirdest dynamic. Like I'm in here. I'm on TV in there. And my kids yeah. are like looking at me in a certain light based on the commercials and the brands and the ads and all that type of stuff. Uh, just to realize how how fast all that happened, um, all that stuff is is it's not like it's like imposter syndrome, but it's like something similar where you're like, how did all this really really happen? Um, I don't I don't think I ever want to lose that though because that's the perspective of life, right? Like you need, I, I'd rather have it that way than on the other side. I tell people that all the time, man. Those exact words, like, man, I never want this to go away. I never want it to be like, yeah, they should. Yeah, they should. <laughs> look at, hey, dude, look at me talking like I'm on your level. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey man, you gonna get out of here and be like, man, big boy is ridiculous. He uh, sitting up here talking. He think we playing career tennis. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, oh right, yeah, right you, back at you. What you got? You, you too, huh? Yeah, you too. That's crazy, <laughs> man. That's crazy. I, I was one. I knew we had things in common. You know what I'm saying? We used to do this thing called Steph Curry is just like you, and, and, I, <laughs> and we have so we have so many things in, in common. You were underrated. I was underrated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, hey is. man, but I'm gonna tell you, bro. It is a pleasure speaking with you i definitely want to say thank you for for giving us this time man and god willing we'll we get with you live and like i said i had a chance to see underrated the documentary available on apple apple tv and make sure you guys check that out man and it was such a great rewind of of your life story bro and thank you for sharing that with us i appreciate you having me Appreciate uh, all the love and uh, yeah, even the fact that I answered a question I never asked, I answered before in uh, in all the years I've been doing interviews. That's I, I appreciate that too. So all thank love, you, my man. brother. One last question, all man. Love. Now how you, now now roster height? How tall are you, Steph? Roster height. I'm listed at six three in the combine when I was coming out of college. I was six two and a quarter without shoes on. Okay, when the bigs, like, the, how tall is Draymond Green? Draymond six eight, six seven. Okay, six, eight. so when the bigs, if y'all flying together, like on a team plane or whatever, does he have to hold his urine till he get to the next spot, or can he fit in a restroom that's on like a plane? If you're talking before 20, they re-outfitted the planes we used okay. back in like 2015. And it's funny you say that because they were like, oh, they're about to re-outfit the planes. We're getting a whole new fleet. All they did really was extend the bathrooms to an appropriate size for NBA players. Gotcha. That was do the you, big perk. That was do, the big perk. Do you have your own seat on the plane? Got my own seat. I actually sit across from Draymond next to Clay um, at the card table. So 
Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of fun with the with the the core guys back there. Do you ever walk into a place and say, "Man, I'm the most famous person in here"? <laughs> maybe like the Davidson College reunion. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Got you, but you know, people are always watching you. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And everybody want a picture with you, bro. Yeah. And you had, you know, and I'm not sitting here saying this because I want you to send Subway sandwiches to our next, you know, on air meeting or anything. But you have such a great spirit, man. And you encourage so many kids, my, my, so many people, but also so many kids, man. And my son is a, a basketball player. He plays at Sierra Canyon as well. And just the way that, that you kind of, you know, they, they're watching you. And to watch you and as a parent to feel that comfortable with my son wanting to be just like you and the way that you live and the way that you play and also sharing underrated with him, bro. I thank you for that as well, Steph. And I appreciate you, my brother. I appreciate that. That's what the story's about. So hopefully we keep uh, spreading that message. All righty. So that was Steph Curry. Steph Curry. He did an interview in the neighborhood. Steph Curry. And you are? Oh. You are? And you are? You're supposed to say your name there, Steph. And you. Oh, my bad, my bad. I was just talking about. <laughs> Like, uh, <laughs> and, and, on, okay. So here we go. Steph Curry, Steph Curry, he's oh, in here. No worry. And you are Steph Curry. And I am Big Boy. And you are Steph Curry. And I am Big Boy, bringing you joy. Hey, man, I never sung that song with anyone before. I just want to see if you'll fuck with me. <laughs> Steph, <laughs> Steph Curry in the neighborhood, Big Boy's neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs>